center and to Nazi um, and Shariar and Nick at the center for organizing this um, reading. It took a lot of work and we're really grateful. And also just to say that um, in this weird time where we're having virtual readings where our, you know, we're not able to be in the same room with all of you and feel the humanity and the love. It's really nice to be able to do it. It's nice that people are really stepping up and giving us a platform and, and so that we're able to meet with you. And the silver lining is that there are people here that never would be able to make it to Berkeley or San Francisco for a reading. So it's really wonderful for, for all of those people to be here and be able, us to be able to see you. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna do a reading, short reading, and then I'm gonna hand it off to, the, to Shide who will follow me. And for those of you who want to follow along, I'm starting from my essay, which starts on page 147. And the title, I'm gonna read the, just a quick um, excerpt from the beginning of the essay. It's called Mothering Across the Cultural Divide. We're still going to church in Brasserie tonight, right? My nine-year-old daughter, Layla, asked as we trudged up the steps to our San Francisco apartment. We just completed our walk home from school and she was already plotting our next move, expressing her desire to take part in the annual Iranian New Year celebration. Of course we are, love, I replied, half wishing she hadn't remembered. I fumbled with the key in the fading light. I'm hungry, whined her four-year-old brother, Kian. It was the witching hour between school, work, and dinner. I was also one week into a two-week stint of single parenting as my husband, Farhad, was away on Ireland on a business trip. So frozen mac and cheese and a glass of wine sounded just about right. Not a long slog through rush hour traffic across the Bay Bridge to Berkeley, where Iranians were gathering to mark their annual rite of spring, jumping over fire to clear out the cobwebs of winter and renew themselves for the year ahead. But I'd promised Layla that we would go, and it was my job to get her and her brother there. We'll just grab some snacks and get in the car, okay? I told my children. Ian shrugged off his backpack just inside the front door and plopped down beside it. I'm not getting in the car. I'm not going anywhere, he declared. Keon, my daughter implored, we have to go. It's really important. After a pause, she added, you'll get to jump over fire. <laughs> this was a brazen attempt to appeal to his known pyromaniac tendencies. I appreciated the strategy of my fiery redheaded girl. She was eager to embrace her, her culture and wasn't going to let her brother's resistance stand in her way. Keon quietly considered his big sister's enticement for a moment, then decided that stubborn refusal was likely to give him more leverage. He crossed his arms over his chest and stayed put. Please, Layla pleaded. We have to go. We're Iranian. This is what Iranians do. I'm not Iranian, Kian replied. <laughs> what are you, I asked, curious about what he'd say, even at the risk of derailing Layla's efforts to get him into the car. I'm American, like mommy, Kian declared with confidence. Besides, what kind of Iranian doesn't even speak Farsi? This was an echo of conversations Layla had been having with for years with her father. She desperately wanted him to teach her Farsi, but for reasons he couldn't really explain to her, he resisted. The sole card-carrying, 100% Iranian in the family didn't seem all that interested in transmitting his culture to his kids, at least not overtly. Along the way, it had become my job. There's more too, by the way. Say again. I said there's a lot more too. A lot more, right. With that, I will pass the baton to Shide. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I almost had to do this on my iPhone, so I'm glad that I get a bigger screen. Um, I. Let me see, how can I not just see myself? Okay, there we go. 
Um, I am really excited that we're celebrating this uh, anthology today. And I'm very proud to have one of the only memoir pieces I've ever written um, published alongside everyone else. So uh, it's, I'm going to try and read the whole thing. Um, and it is about my grandmother who since writing this has passed away. So I will uh, dedicate this to her. It's called Forget Me Not and it's on page 187. Sometimes I think my grandmother's dead and then I remember she's not. When I visit my family in LA, I go and see her at the rehab center where she's been rehabilitating for 12 years. They've stopped coloring her hair. It's all white now, thicker than ever before beautiful and also frightening. Growing up, her hair was always dyed, blown out every Friday, 10 a.m., a steady appointment. When I go see her, she only says a few words, mostly to my mom, who enthusiastically asks her questions like she's a newborn. She smiles at my mom, her words in Farsi like, I'm okay, I'm good. Are you good? Loose in her mouth. It's good to hear her voice and to know there's enough will inside of her to still want to speak. I don't know what to say to her, so I rub lotion into her hands. The lotion smells like nothing. Her nails are now blank, where there was always some version of red polish. My mom feeds her, and I'm amazed how she treats my grandmother like she has a long way to go, like bringing her slushed up watermelon to drink and buying her cute pajamas will make her happy. And who knows, maybe it does. She's smiling for a second, and it feels like enough. I rub the lotion in slowly, massaging her soft skin, trying to pass my love through my touch, my mom repeating over and over again who I am, that I'm married now. I live in San Francisco, how I came all the way here just to see my grandmother. Everyone has a different version of my grandmother. Mine goes like this. She loves me deeply, but she's also jealous of me. She holds me in her lap when I'm a child, lets me pull on her pull pearls and tells me the most important thing in life is love when I'm 13. She also becomes anxious and depressed easily and wants all of my mom's attention. And so for a little while, I hate her for that. I watch her take too many pills, dramatically beat on, a, on her own chest when she's upset with my grandfather. But I also watch her start her life over in a new country and grow curious about my life, wanting to know if I have a boyfriend, if I've ever loved someone, making sure I know she didn't really love my grandfather like that since they were first cousins, that she missed out on a romantic kind of love. A person is never one thing and my grandmother is many, but I doubt anyone sees her the way I see her. Equal love, equal pain. My mom got sick my last year of college. A couple months before that, my grandmother started forgetting things. First, she forgot where the keys were, words slipping on her tongue, and then she forgot to turn the stove off. It became dangerous to live alone, and so she had to move into the rehabilitation center. My mom didn't tell her about the cancer. What was the point? It would upset her, and she'd forget about it soon after. At first, I hated going to see my grandmother. The hallways reeked of piss and microwavable dinners. Visiting her was another thing I was burdened with. My mom, the dutiful daughter, out of love or guilt, I'm not sure, tried to make things as normal as possible. We'd be right back, she'd tell her, so she wouldn't lose it when we left. My grandmother despised my dead grandfather for not coming to visit her, and no one ever told her the truth. When she could still walk, we'd take her to restaurants and family gatherings and things didn't seem all that different, but the truth was, everything was. I don't know when things changed exactly, mostly because I wasn't expecting anything to. Maybe the summer I graduated from college and moved back to LA, she reached a certain stage of Alzheimer's that transformed her into not a different person, but the truest form of herself. Or maybe I was the one who changed. In college, I started dealing with my own anxiety and depression. I felt like I was drowning. It became difficult to breathe, to hear myself, that part of me that was on my side and could calm me down. No one could help me, not even myself. I started taking medication just like my grandmother had and nine months into it, when I was feeling more like myself, decided to taper off. 
I didn't want to depend on anything outside of myself to be okay, but also I didn't want to be like her. Maybe experiencing what she'd suffer from for so many years made me understand her and not believe it had just been a cry for attention. That summer, I didn't feel like carrying my resentment towards her around anymore. My mom, aunt, and I would wheel her to the corner cafe where the owners knew us and would help us lift her wheelchair over the incline of the entrance. She sat there looking comfortable, wrapped in blankets, wearing her PJs with the ducks on them. She asked me why I was showing my breasts to everyone. How else am I supposed to find a husband, I said, and we laughed about it. It felt like a very long time since I'd laughed with her. She asked me why my jeans had so many holes in them. I bought it that way, I said, and she couldn't believe me. But every time she looked at me, it was as if she was seeing me for the first time. Her eyes lit up, she smiled, and then she looked at my mom and said, she's beautiful, more beautiful than you. We laughed again. And yes, she couldn't tell you my name or what year it was or why she was sitting in a wheelchair, but there was an ease to her I never witnessed before. The ability to just sit and be, not worried about all that had gone wrong, not dreading life and all its uncertainties. I started to see her as a child, a teenager, a young woman filled with hope and the desire to love and be loved and a culture, a country, a family telling her what she wanted didn't matter. My mom asked her if she wanted ice cream, but it was a pointless question because it was her favorite thing in the world. The vanilla ice cream came and I fed it to her and she nodded her head side to side in approval and said, bah, bah. it was the ultimate sign of bliss. There are certain things that take me by surprise, like when my mom tells me about my grandmother and the dentist, how when my mom was little, my grandmother would get dressed up and go to the dentist on a weekly basis. As a child, my mom thought her mother's teeth were seriously damaged. And even though there's no confirmation of an affair, we can assume there was something going on between them. I'm also surprised when my older cousin tells me that when he was 24 and first moved into his place, my grandmother would call him a couple times a week that this was their secret ritual no one knew about. That my grandmother would talk to him about girls and relationships and tell him to make sure he was using condoms. I don't expect to feel jealous of this, but I do. The letter surprised me even more, how when we clean out her closet, we find letters written on the inside of book covers to my grandfather after he died. I asked my aunt to read them to me because I can't read Farsi and the voice is poetic and desperately in love. All I want is for God to take me to you so I can be with you again, she writes. I was unaware of this poetry that lived inside of her and apparently this deep and passionate love from my grandfather I would never witness a day in my life. But like I said, there are so many different versions of any one person, so I don't know why I'm so surprised. I shouldn't be surprised by the white hair or her heavy breathing that made me think of death the last time I saw her or how she kept scratching herself obsessively and I asked my mom about it and she said it was like a phantom itch that she'd grown accustomed to scratching herself to find relief when the wound had been there and now that the wound had healed, the very act of scratching helped her feel some sort of ease. I shouldn't be surprised by how I wanted to cry when my mom looked at her like she was her baby and my grandmother looked at my mom like she was the mom. I shouldn't be surprised that this disease took her from us, but also gave some of her back to us. I shouldn't be surprised that when the fortune teller who tells the future from coffee grinds tells my mom my grandmother will die by the end of the year, it's not sadness I feel for her, but relief. I can feel how tired she is, how time is pressing on her body, how close she is to being free. What doesn't surprise me though is how imperfect she is, how imperfect we all are and that she tried the best to do the only thing she ever really wanted to do, to love and be loved. Thank you. Damn, that Abba. was good. Abba. <laughs> Beautiful. Very good, very good. Okay, I think I'm on, yeah? Yes, you are. Great, well, uh, I'm very happy to be the, I'm very happy to be the caboose to this lovely literary gathering um, and and very very happy and grateful to have an essay in, uh, in um, just uh, by way of 
preface. Um, a few years ago, I read a very well-known uh, essay uh, called The Knife by the amazing late Richard Selzer. Uh, uh, it was called The Knife, and it was from a book of essays he has called Notes on the Art of Surgery. Uh, and uh, it put me to thinking about an occasion where I had an encounter with a knife. And I started writing about it. And as I wrote this, the way these things work as you write them, you find out it's really not about the thing you started at, but it's uh, hopefully about something bigger. And it turned out to be about the sacrifices that are made, as that we make as individuals, as families, communities, even nations, and the implications of those. So at any rate, this ended up being uh, called the essay called Sacrifices. And I'm going to just read the first couple of pages more or less from it. So we start. Shortly after my new girlfriend, Debbie, took me to meet her parents, I sat locked in their apartment with her stepfather, Jack, holding a knife to my neck. We were in the living room, Jack and me staring at each other and listening to my girlfriend and her mother, now locked out, fist banging on the door. They sounded scared. Jack, please don't hurt him, they shouted. Debbie and I had met only a month earlier. She had answered my ad for a roommate, open-minded M or F, moved in within a week, and we fought and then had sex the very first night. She never moved to her own bedroom. She was average looking in most respects with straight blonde hair down to the shoulder blades and a bit of a baby face, red apple cheeks, and very light blue eyes and an easy and generous smile. She was neither too thin nor fat, neither tall nor short. Now many years later, I, for the most part, picture her sunk comfortably into an old overstuffed sofa, smoking and drinking a glass of red wine just poured from a screw cap jug and looking at her raised bare feet. I have perfect feet, she would say. That was important to her. She was 29. I was 18. I had come from Iran to the United States two years earlier, first to Oklahoma, which I had not liked, and then a few weeks later to San Diego. The open-minded in my ad, at least to me, meant don't hate me because of where I'm from. She wondered out loud what I was looking for, and I set her mind at ease. This was 1980. It was the time of first prize pigs and county fairs named Ayatollah of camel jockey go home slogans, and of no dogs or Iranians allowed signs in restaurants. This was also the year that President Jimmy Carter, in part to prop up his flaccid presidency during the hostage crisis, ordered all Iranians to be registered, which included fingerprinting and prison style photographs. And so somewhere there's a file with a photograph of me staring blankly into the camera holding a board bearing my last and first name and an INS registration number. That number became my naturalization number when over a decade later, I took US citizenship. Early during my stay in San Diego, I was often mistaken for Mexican. An Iranian friend, the only other in a high school of 1600, mentioned that they hate Iranians here. We'll just tell them we're Mexican then, I replied enthusiastically. They hate them even more, he said. Around the same time, post-revolutionary chaos in Iran cut off funds to students abroad. And so young men and women from good homes, beloved and protected by doting parents, often over, over pampered, were left stranded. We went out and got jobs and moved to smaller apartments in poor neighborhoods and found roommates. We learned that the only work available to smart and only partly educated doctors and lawyers and engineers is fairly menial attending gas stations and newspaper stands, delivering pizza, selling ice cream, and if you were lucky, grading homework at college. I did most of these with mixed results. The hourly minimum wage was $2.95 then, and that minus taxes was what you got. Although delivering pizza had tips, the income was offset by the need to have your own car and insurance and pay for gas. Selling ice cream was particularly disastrous for me as my assigned route consisted primarily of housing projects for the Vietnamese boat people who were poorer than most poor. They would send their sweet faced and smiling three or four year olds running happily, smacking their lips, almost tasting the ice cream they would choose, 
holding out only a penny or at most a nickel. That was all they could afford. Sometimes I gave them the ice cream, sometimes I did not. Some students managed by turning this into a game. I remember a competition to see who had the lowest monthly food bill. $30 was the answer. The winners being two women who every day cooked a variety of subtle stews and elegant rice dishes, filling their house with aromas of bright spices and wonderfully fresh basil and tarragon and parsley. Some did not manage. A friend returned home when his money ran out, was dispatched to the front. The war with Iraq had started, sent me one or two passionate patriotic letters, and then no more. Another dealt in drugs and disappeared. To our inquiries, his family replied that he had moved to another state to study aerospace engineering. Many plowed ahead, navigating through this unanticipated and unwelcome phase of insecurity and limbo. We knew that it was all temporary, which made this, like most student poverty, different from real poverty. The student is passing through a stage, whether or not planned, while the real poor are held by poverty, almost owned by it, having no faith that it will pass, imagining no plans to work through it. The real poor often given to despair and passively accept their status. In a sense, being poor as a student is not being poor at all. It is simply getting an education. Back home in Tehran, my mother sacrificed animals and fed the poor. In danger, my mother called out to the prophets instinctively, Ya Abram Isaw Yaqub, she would say, and vowed a sheep. Many times after an illness or some danger or even a long trip, the rabbi and his assistant arrived at our house, a sheep in tow with a rope around its neck as leash. They prayed and sharpened the large knife. They held the sheep and gave it water to drink. And then they quickly ran the knife across, across his throat. Blood spouted. The sheep screamed and fell and convulsed and kicked air, and blood circled the drain in the yard. They rubbed the bloody knife across my forehead or my sister's and read from the Torah. A few years ago, when my uncle died, being by his side, I held his still warm hand until cold, and then his forehead until it too was yellow and void of blood, and then his shoulders, and then his chest chased by the wave of death from extremities inward, covering his body with a sheet only after the warmth and color of life had fully retreated. The sheep, in contrast, were skinned warm. In Tehran, beggars knocked on our door, door daily. They were an army of the broken, men and women and children. They missed an eye or limbs, a leg and arm, fingers. They wore the colorful, loose-fitting garb of the provinces, often mended and perhaps hand-me-downs. Sometimes the women had blue-green tattoos on their cheeks and foreheads. They spoke with thick, beautiful Kurdish or Turkish or Gilaki accents. Mostly when the door opened, the words streamed, sing-songy and drawn out. Oh, madam, please, please help. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I have no sleep. I'm a stranger, I have no one. My husband beats me, my wife died and left me with these orphans. Make me a sacrifice to your son for the sake of your boy. May Allah save him for you, a sacrifice for his head. Some did not talk. They stretched out a hand and stood bent with their heads down or just looked at you. My mother usually would give them some coins or call out to the maid, bring some food for this lady. If it was in the morning, you could hear the clack clack of the garbage man pushing his cart down the corner. Bring the trash also, my mother would add. Thank you. Thank you all. That was wonderful. Um, uh, I thought maybe uh, we could talk a little bit about um, how this collection evolved, Catherine and Layla. And also, um, one of the things that was so wonderful was to hear a variety of experience in the diaspora, as well as um, the idea that the locations are broad, right? They're, Iraj just read about his memories of growing up in Tehran and being in the U.S. as a young person. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the impetus for the book and the, the way you organized it. And also, if you were looking for specific things or did they come to you organically? 
Um, do you want me to start, Layla? I'll s okay. <laughs> um, well, the book came out of this writing workshop that Persis mentioned, uh, a workshop called, um, I can't remember the title of it now, right? basically, Finding Your Iranian Identity, writing about your Iranian identity. That, and that's where Layla and I met. And when we first sought to do this collection of nonfiction writing from the diaspora, we really had no idea what we would find or, or what our goal was. We just sort of put out a, a call for entries and we saw what we got. And we got a lot of, we were surprised and delighted that we got so many different essays and so, much, so many different kinds of contributions. And um, I think what we, what we wanted to do was to um, put together a collection that reflected the current diaspora, which, um, as, you know, which we found ourselves a part of. And this is, I think, really a tribute to your teaching, Persis, um, and your contextualizing all of us in a, in a, in a diversified, diaspora where um, it's not it's not just people who've come first generation to the US from Iran or people who were or even second generation to born to Iranian parents but but the people the families that are changing and morphing and, and diversifying within the US um, so as we found really interesting compelling modern essays uh, from that group of people we started getting excited about um, basically starting to with um, that kind of goal of creating a really contemporary collection of writing that hadn't really been published before. And then the content, we really were, we were excited to, to um, find stories that really explored new kinds of content. And do you want to take it from there, Layla? Yeah, you you described that really well, Catherine. Um, I I think um, yeah, you know what you said about not necessarily we didn't necessarily set out to um, to put together a collection with a you know a super specific point of view, and I think that was partly because we we just, you know, we were so new at this, we didn't know, really, we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't know what we were going to receive, and then when these essays started coming in, and we realized, wow, you know, this, these are so good, and these are, um, you know, about so much more than, um, you know, what many of the, I guess, memoirs to date had had focused on with respect to um, writing from the, the diaspora. And we started to realize that people were taking tremendous risks in, in what they were sending us as far as the content. And people were pushing themselves, people who were um, poets and fiction writers primarily were sending us nonfiction, some of them writing nonfiction for the first time. Um, so that was very exciting. And then when we started to see that as far as um, themes are concerned, that uh, many of the, the themes of these pieces were really boundary pushing in many ways, um, having to do with um, with issues that uh, Iranians um, on the whole uh, for a variety of reasons don't maybe talk about as much or um, certainly don't write about necessarily as much and that, that haven't been published widely. And we felt a real responsibility there and we felt like that was a real opportunity to to showcase those stories and those voices and to um, you know amplify the community in that way. And as Catherine said, really um, show a, a more modern, modern side to the diaspora. And um, and I also agree, Catherine, with what you said with respect to Persis in particular, and sort of this notion of the diaspora being um, more than perhaps what you know some of us. Uh, grew up thinking it was, which is just like specifically like maybe just first generation um, individuals, but um, that encompasses uh, that and so much more. And, um, and it's, it's a large 
it's a large tent and everybody, everybody is, um, you know, we're, we're all part of it in different ways and that's beautiful and that's okay. And so, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody else want to, um, ask mm -hmm. either the authors or the editors a question? I mean, I can say more, but I, I want to make sure that if the audience, if you're in the audience and you loved it and you want to, um, hear more, read more, we encourage you to get the book, but also this is your chance to engage with these wonderful authors and editors. So I just type wanted to away. say that um, the chat is open, so you're more than welcome to type in your questions uh, and comments on the chat and share it that way with us. And keep it clean and keep it relevant, please. Uh, oh, the first reading when the woman asked to learn Farsi. How often is it that Iranians do not want to pass their heritage on to the next generation? Okay. So um, that was you, Catherine. The question says, um, uh, how often is it that Iranians don't want to pass their heritage on to the next generation? Well, I can't speak for all Iranians. I think it's, but I think what's interesting is that it's very, it's very individualized and everyone has their own story. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know that I can speak um, broadly. I think to some degree it falls, it's it falls to, it becomes, it falls to the mothers and women of the culture of the family. And um, I had a friend who said, this is a woman's work and that's what you're doing. And only anecdotally, I can say that my son, who had less of a strong connection to his Iranian heritage than his sister, Layla, told me that in his high school, he had a bunch of friends who are Iranian American. He said, mom, the ones whose moms are Iranian speak Farsi, the ones whose dads are Iranian don't. So I don't know whether that's just sort of, that's just my sort of anecdotal experience. I don't have, I haven't really done much of a deep research <laughs> into passing on you know, why people do and why people don't. And, and one thing that um, is interesting is that p it gets passed on in different ways. So part of what I was hinting, where I left off, you know, the, in, my, in that first paragraph or first reading is that there, the culture is transmitted not just through language, but through customs and th through ways of being in the world. And I think that's what, uh, that's certainly what our family has taken away from this because it wasn't, you know, while my husband wasn't comfortable necessarily speaking Farsi to the kids or teaching them Farsi, and it's not actually that easy to te teach a language <laughs> to uh, to children when they're growing up. You have to. It's a very um, any of you who've raised kids in multilingual households know that it has to be a really intentional kind of practice. Um, my daughter will say that she understands now. She will say that she understands in in a really broad way what it means to be Iranian and what her, how her dad is connected to the hair, to the culture and what he did, what he did pass on to her sort of in the, in every day, um, in the, throughout the rhythms of everyday life, right? The cooking, the generosity, the parties, the kind of way of, um, the way of being in the world, which although someone can spend a lot of time, I'm sure you other, um, other my other fellow readers can talk, attest to this, um, although you spend a lot of time in this country and you become somewhat Americanized, there's still that something about you that is still Iranian and that comes through. So, um. Cool. Great. Thank you both. Um, so a couple questions that I think resonate uh, with all of you. Um, and maybe we can start with Shide and then Iraj. Uh, and then move to the editors if they'd like. But um, several comments talked about the deeply personal nature of your writing. How do your relatives feel about it? Is it scary to disclose some of those complicated feelings um, and put them on the page um, and have them be public? Because as we know, um, there are certain th issues that are taboo to talk about or that um, there's this culture of scrutinizing each other or um, being very conscious of your public self 
um, versus your private self. So I wonder if Shide and Iraj could start with any concerns you have or in general about writing about deeply personal things. I can start. Um, let's see. I just have my big face in front of me. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I grew up in a very like open minded family, but still it's very hard to talk about the uncomfortable, messy parts of life. And because I write fiction, mostly, I mean, I'm writing more memoir now, but um, I think my intention was to just write a piece, not necessarily thinking it was going to get published or that other people would read it. And, you know, I immediately showed it to my mom and she gave, uh, got permission for me to show it to other relatives. And, you know, their, the reaction from, I could think of one in particular being like, well, that's not true. That's not how I remembered this. You got it wrong, kind of defensive or, you know, and I think that speaks to just, you know, the nature and the beauty of what this is, which is you're writing your experience and it's yours. Um, but yeah, it's like, uncom you know, it's uncomfortable to put it out there, but there's also something really like powerful and liberating. Um, and yeah, it's like I had an intention to honor my grandmother, but another relative could read this and see it as an insult, you know, or like, no, I didn't, she wasn't depressed or she didn't, but it's like, that was my unique experience. And that's the only thing I could really write about. Um, so I think it's cool and scary. <laughs> <laughs> Iraj? Yeah, well, there, there, yeah, there are many, many uh, angles of observation to this. First of all, as, as a writer, uh, you know, we just need to learn to toughen up. You know, where as, as a writer, you get rejected, you write pieces nobody likes, you, uh, you know, uh, so this is, this falls within the category of just toughen up a little bit. Uh, uh, then also as, as, as just as an individual, uh, I'm just a big fan of write your truth and let her rip, you know, the consequences kind of be damned. I never ask permission. The only time that I have modified some aspect of the truth a little bit is if I know because of something I write somebody, let's say is gonna get thrown in prison or get seriously hurt. Uh, I know for a fact there was one sentence in one of my essays that my mother had said, and uh, it was kind of borderline. And at the time she lived in Iran, so I put it in my safely dead grandmother's mouth, you know, uh, because they couldn't do much to her by then. Uh, uh, so, so there's just as a person, you know, you, know, you, ju you just, I, I, I just believe you just do it. And, uh, you know, uh, you get in trouble, you get in trouble. Also, again, going back to the writer, as a writer, uh, I think it's dangerous to start self-censoring while you're writing. Uh, you know, you can always edit things out, you know, in, in the revision stage. So if you're going and you're writing, just let it happen. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, you will be doing many, many, many revisions and there are chances. Great, thank you. Um, there's a lot of really positive comments. So I hope you get a chance to look at them to all of you. Um, lots of appreciation for your vulnerability, your honesty, also appreciation to the editors for expanding their understanding of what the diaspora is. Um, there's a question here that I think each of you could probably um, respond to, and I believe that's Catherine's sister, Susan. Um, I know there are young aspiring writers listening tonight. What advice do you have for those young people? who want to get published or who are interested in having their voice amplified by the work of their fellow um, writers. And I know that for young Iranian American writers in particular, books like these have a particular effect. And I wonder if 
um, any of you want to comment on what it feels like to be a part of something collectively as opposed to something that's individual. Catherine, do you want to start? Sure. I think, well, one thing that's, one thing that's kind of amazing just to start with is just to be having, and I know that I've talked to Layla about this too, hearing you all read your pieces after we've sat with them for so long and read them over and like over and over and over again, it's such a gift. So thank you for that. Um, and I think that one of the surprising things for me, and I think Layla too, is the community that we feel that this has created. I mean, I didn't know, I don't think I knew anybody who's ended up in, before I started this project. Um, and now we have this amazing community of writers that's, that we're all going forward together. And it, um, I have not ever published a book that's just mine, so I don't have this experience, but it does feel good to be able to champion something that's a collective voice from a you know, diverse group and say, this is really important. I want to get this out in the world and not feel like I'm being, you know, egotistical about it. Um, and I, and there are, we have such a range of writers represented. I mean, some are still in school and some are really well established and published a lot. And to be able to bring that diversity of ex writing experience and publishing experience together is, has been so um, gratifying. And I think that that, and I guess to, to speak to Susie's question, um, I would say that, you know, seek out those opportunities to publish your work, whether in literary journals or, you know, calls to, um, for anthologies like this and, you know, whatever you can to put your work out there. And I look to those of you who are in academics also to speak to that. Um, uh, any advice, Iraj, Leila, Shide, you want to give to anybody who's in the audience? Sure. Um, be relentless, work your butt off. Um, but yeah, seriously, like I remember Persis, I forgot what the name of that first anthology you put out was. A World Between? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So that was one of my first you know, experiences with reading an anthology where I felt so connected to the work and I felt that community feeling. And, you know, now I've had my work published in two different anthologies. So to me, the anthology feels like a strong way of, yeah, being a part of a community and also feeling like we can have these conversations together um, and expand people's perspectives of what it means to be Iranian. But yeah, seriously, just if you're, you're trying to do this, you got to be relentless and, you know, tap into what is that real reason why you're doing it. Because that's what's going to pull you through. I can add a couple of things to, to that. Uh, uh, one of the things, uh, since, since you asked for, for sort of younger writers or starting writers, one of, one of the things uh, I always say to my students is to be a good writer, give yourself to permission to write poorly. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you see some of the first drafts of the stuff I write and probably some of the other things is borderline, I know mine, borderline unreadable and, you know, Nobody's gonna die if it looks bad at first. You know, you're, you're gonna you're gonna fix it. Um, the other thing is write the thing that every bit of your body says you don't want to write about. You know, there are things in your head that are banging around for years, sometimes decades, and every fiber of your being says, "Oh, I really don't want to write about this," and it's not going away. And that's the thing to write. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we just have like one more minute. Um, I just want to say there's a lot of praise. You're all such amazing writers. Um, lots, a few people who are Iranian themselves or Iranian American themselves feel a connection to you all and your work. Um, Cyrus asked the question about, is there going to be an anthology of poetry? 
That's your job, man, Cyrus. Um, it's a lot of work, and I, I want to make a special shout out to Catherine and Layla because I know how much work it is, having done three anthologies myself. And I just want to say I'm thrilled to be both a part of it and also to see someone else take this on. Um, there's no more important moment in our history to exemplify the idea of collective action on behalf of those who don't have enough of a voice, never mind decent representation. And um, when Catherine and Layla and I talked about them doing this, I was like, you know, Iran's, the good news about Iran um, was the Iran nuclear deal, but I wasn't so confident that it was going to all be over with that. And as it turns out, we still need to really um, find ways to represent our experiences and the complexity of our culture and our diaspora. So I, I really thank you both for the amazingly hard work that you did to make this possible. Um, do you want to say anything about other readings, Catherine and Layla, that you're doing? Because I know um, one of the disappointing things is that um, connecting with people in person is even more uh, wonderful, but this is a good substitute. But you're doing some more readings. Do you want to just say a little bit about when those are and how people can find out about them? Because there'll be different, different configurations of readers, right? Uh, this is a big shout out to um, Mandana and Roya, two contributors of ours who have taken on organizing readings of um, multiple people on two sort of on two coasts, although it doesn't matter as much now that we're all sheltered at home. But um, so, and these will be posted as events on our. We have a Facebook page, uh, "My Shadow Is My Skin," and a and a Twitter account where those will be. But they will we'll be creating events as they there's. We have dates and times, um, and they're solidifying. So there's, there'll be one on May 9th at 5 p.m. Pacific. I'm just going to give these times in Pacific time. On May 16th at 2 p.m. Pacific, that's, um, and then on May 23rd at 5 p.m. Pacific. And these are readings um, of a ver variety of different people, not necessarily the same people you're seeing tonight. So that'll be interesting if you want to tune in and hear other people read their work. Um, yeah, thank you. So your Facebook page has those listed on it, right? Not yet, but they it will. Okay. Listed as go ahead. And we always update Twitter um, with those too. So there are a few different ways to keep tabs on on what's yeah. upcoming. Some of us don't do Twitter, so make sure you uh, do it in places where the old people can find it. <laughs> Um, and then I wanted to say there are lots of people saying thank you for this and that they could join from places as far away as New York and Toronto. So as you said, Catherine, there's a silver lining to doing it this way, which is that people can participate. So thank you all. We're going to wrap it up. And I want to just um, do another shout out. If you have the book in your hand, hold it up and let us see. <laughs> Get the book, support authors, support these writers. A lot of the writers in this book are either um, established and have other um, pieces of writing or they're up and coming or they have blogs like Shide has a blog, follow her. Um, so support the authors that represent your community and your experience as much as you can. And with that, I wanna say, Thank you and see everybody's faces. Um, I can't see you, my fellow. Oh, there you are. Okay. And thank you to Shariar for organizing this. Thank you. Thank, you. And thank you to Nazi and Diaspora Arts Connection for co presenting. It's a wonderful organization, so I hope you also follow them. They also do readings as well. And stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.